the uh, census was published for the United Kingdom for, t for 2011. We do a census of our demogra demographic statistics every 10 years. And quite astonishing growth in the diversity and pluralism in the United Kingdom. I think actually I'd correct one of the statements. The evidence on segregated communities doesn't support the general belief that we have lots of them in the United Kingdom. The evidence is quite clear that uh, segregation is not increasing, it's actually decreasing. But uh, this is perhaps some of the confusion because of the melange between the political debate and the economic and statistical discussions. The census showed in, uh, in last week's publication some quite astonishing, uh, let's just do this, data that in, in London, for example, 37% of the residents of London today weren't born in the United Kingdom. So that's an astonishing global city, and that's replicated throughout large cities. And it's not replicated, however, in the more rural areas. So there is, you could summarize, a very, very diverse community, but divergent in the sense from cities to, um, to the rural area. Let, let me concentrate on getting this. Sorry. There we go. I hope it's worth it. Okay. So is that visible to everyone? Is that clear? So my topic, uh, when I was invited to come, first of all, thank you very much to the Institute of Cultural Diversity. The discussions that I participated in yesterday, I found uh, inspiring, interesting, and uh, certainly not enough time. And I reflect on the view that there is a di dichotomy or a divergence between diplomats and practitioners, as was referred to a couple of speeches ago. I don't think this should worry us too much. I think there is room in this discourse for many and multi layers of debate and discussion. And uh, I found some of the uh, diplomats interesting, particularly because they were willing to expose the views that they had and challenge the uh, history that they had in their past, past roles. But they are influential, and so we can't ignore them. My track I'll come on to talk about is uh, that I was an academic, to start with, and I became a diplomat, and then I've now escaped back to, uh, my friend John, back to um, universities. And principally because I think, as an oldie, I think I can have much more impact through thinking and communicating and disseminating ideas than in my younger days when I was very much in the field. And I shall talk a little bit about that. My topic is actually an added area to the debate generally. I think that cultural diplomacy is about governments. I think it is about influential organizations, institutions, and NGOs. But I think it's most powerful when it's between people. And I think that the people element we often forget because it's very difficult to mobilize and very difficult to generalize about. So that's the theme, um, essentially, of my short talk. And it's, the issue is common to us all. It's how we interact and coexist with people who are different. And it's central to our personal sense of security and stability. And I don't think it's as simple as often is presented in the clash of civilizations discourse. This notion that a couple of speakers ago was talking about the Arab or the West, I think this is not helpful at all. 
I think the tensions that I will refer to that arise from divisive pluralism, from our lack of attention to the management of pluralist societies, is actually a problem um, that confronts us at all levels in all places and not confined to the higher level clash discourse that some would, would argue. I think human security is the critical issue is our safety, the safety of our families and the ability we have to coexist in very complex and difficult societies. Um, I think this needs a culture perspective, which is what I shall try and unfold. I actually have a lot more faith than many uh, writers that I uh, explore about the ability that we have as people not to be captured by our culture. So I come from a starting point, which I think, and I shall define, I think, what I mean by culture. Uh, and I've done a lot of thinking of this based on the experience and my observations from my career. We can build secure lives that, that are independent of intractable and somehow unmoving culture. It is not the case that my children have to adopt my culture and my traditions. In fact, our observations show that's clearly not the case. Culture is constructed, we build it, we mobilize it, we can use it, therefore it shouldn't capture us and we shouldn't have these discourses about uh, how traditions can be incompatible and so forth. When you look to explore some of the really intractable and difficult issues at a time, I don't know what you're like, but my tutor's always said, read widely and read wisely but you can't find a huge amount of literature on how to live together in complex uh, and uh, diverse societies. There's a lots of opinions, but there's very little analysis and insufficient evidence. What we do need, what we know we need, is a considerable amount of dialogue. There's been a lot of discussion about that. We need this essence of mutual respect, which is very much a human issue. And importantly, we need a real effort to appreciate what is important to others. That we do know, but that's about all that the literature tells us. A very famous poet from uh, Nigerian ancestry um, was great. He had better words than I could to talk about the creative force and the dangers of the infinite variety of humankind. And his thesis in his work, in his poetry, is that the real realization of human potential the eradication of poverty, the enhancement of liberty, and the triumph of justice, these are the issues that must define the relationships between people that can be both creative and dangerous. When I returned to the university, I went to lead a research institute at Coventry University, which focused almost entirely on the struggles of co communities which were diverse and which were not coherent. There were many riots in British cities, as in European cities and throughout the world, the African subcontinent, as we heard yesterday. And the institute that I led um, built bridges, focused on links and bonds, and sought to, tr to try and understand better the forces at work in uh, fractured communities. The issue is, as I said earlier, how we... Sorry, I'm getting bizarre on this. that human security, insecurity accompanies people's difficulty with the difference in complex social relations in a very connected world. So in essence, our problem, the problem to resolve and to study is how we can cope with the difference that exists. This morning, I'm going to look at a, a couple of things, three aspects of cultural <coughs> diversity that haven't been talked about a lot uh, in my conversations with you all yesterday but are facts of life for um, many of our contemporary societies. And these three characterize much of my work in recent years. The three are belief, and I'm very conscious about the amount of literature written about religion and faith, but I think it's belief that matters. It's our ability to have views and express them. Um, pluralism and young people. It's a very interesting discussion uh, yesterday afternoon about the role of women, very important. And I thought it was a very stimulating session. 
but I was reflecting during that conversation how the gender distribution between men and women is a very important issue to, to address and the inequality, the discrimination and so forth. But I'd like to put to you this morning that there's an additional divide in our society between the oldies and young people. And I think the power of young people to mobilise is hugely important, as I hope to describe. But first an aside on culture and cultural relations. This is important, I think, to be clear where you're coming from. I believe that culture is a system of shared beliefs, values, customs, behaviours and artefacts that we use to cope with our world and with one another. I think identity is the way we express our culture and it's important for two reasons. We need to belong and we need to be different. And both those are important and that's why I think culture is a, in its broadest sense is cultivated behaviour. We control it. It's ours to mobilise and use. It expresses who we are and why we're different from someone else. Who am I? Well, I started as a university economist and I ended up as uh, an expert on cultural relations or intercultural relationships. That journey was long and I won't bore you with it. But in the process, I became a huge fan of human diversity. As an economist, I was sent to the former Soviet Union to help with the transition to market economy, following the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of perestroika and so forth. It was a very interesting time. What I found there was not a technical job to advise on the development of MBAs at Russian business schools who were churning out Congratiev planners by the dozen. What I found was that was an astonishing difference in the way people thought, the way their traditions had informed them, and their exposure to the intercourse of global affairs. And I became a real interested in human diversity, and I moved as a result from being an economist to one that looked much more at sociology, social psychology, and anthropological relationships, which is where I am now. So I moved from being resigned to the difficulties of diversity to believe that human diversity is an asset and it's a better place to be. So I very clearly, at outset of my presentation, will tell you, I think diverse communities are better than monocultural ones. I think diverse workplaces are more creative, are more interesting, are more engaging. I think the, the realisation of human potential is more likely in diverse communities than in those that are not diverse. And I don't think I have enough evidence to be persuasive. So my return to university is to explore those issues and to try and uh, develop more understanding. So to my three issues, belief. When I look to try and understand the nature of relationships that I observed and the diversity I experienced, I saw many in the last 20 or 30 years, many relationships were fraught by a challenge of belief. The centre of the violence I observed in many of the countries in which I worked was a chilling desire that many of you discussed yesterday and have experienced to destroy people who are different to you. Even Osama bin Laden, who most of us read about and discuss in the context of an Arab versus Western discourse, Osama bin Laden's writing urged his followers to seek out Muslims who are not like him and kill them. So there's this passion, this violence that somehow was driven by belief. Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated some 20 years ago by an extreme fundamentalist Israeli who didn't agree with the approach he was taking to try and resolve the traumas in the Middle East. Extremism of belief then appeared to be grounded in a totalitarian assumption that one set of people should dominate and perpetuate. So my interest in belief is at the core of my interest in cultural diversity. But belief wasn't a narrative prevailed upon by the diversity or multicultural movement. So if you look at most of the discussions, the demographic analysis, belief doesn't feature as strongly as I believe it should. And when I looked at my own reading, there was this whole set of diversity heroes that had strong beliefs, 
but their strong beliefs were characterized by a common value that they would pursue the interests of their own belief, but unambiguously create room for others to have their own. These, uh, these leaders you'll recognize um, were driven by a passion for their own belief which allowed and accommodated a plural, pluralism of belief. The best definition I found of, of this line, this divisiveness, was going back to Martin Luther King, who you'll know talked a lot about the color line. And I always used to think, before I read more widely, that this was between black and white. It was between Christian and Muslim. It was a line that was drawn between difference. But actually, King's work was heavily influenced by his discussion with Mahatma Gandhi. And he defined the, this divide as people who would live between people who would live together as brothers and people who would perish together as fools. So how to respond? My return, I suppose, to how to develop a program which would reflect the positive aspects of diversity. I kept returning to my, um, my third aspect of contemporary culture and cultural diversity, the importance of young people. Martin Luther King was, was only 26 when he led his first um, uh, fight against the, the segregation on buses. Uh, Gandhi, 20, when he fought the South African pass laws. Uh, the Dalai Lama, less than 20, when he led his people out of t the occupied Tibet. This is a, a world, of course, that's added now by demographics and uh, the youth bulge, which you'll know, you'll know very well. How many of you here remember the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin? This is 17 years ago, to be precise. There's one or two of us here. 70% <coughs> of the people living in Gaza today were not even born. This is a, a world that's very young, where the young people have uh, much greater ability and affinity with the ability to change and adapt. So I think pluralism is more possible if we focus strategies around them. 65% of South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Indian subcontinent are under 24. I'm getting told off because I'm taking too long. I'm sorry. I'm just going to skip through a little bit. If anyone wants my paper, which is written, I just send me an, uh, a link and I'll, I'll do it. I'll give you the, um, the reference at the end. I'm going to focus on uh, the program that, uh, that I developed when I worked um, in the British Council, which was my last uh, career uh, stage. And this was a program which tried to resolve some of the issues that I've only touched on very briefly. It's a program that we called Reconnect because my assumption was the analysis that we'd done built on a simple insight that struggling and difficult and divisive social relations usually happened when some form of disconnect had taken place. It wasn't a case of my connecting people to things that I understood. It was an observation that of all the reasons why there's divisive pluralism, why there is tension in societies, most of them come down to the fact that some disconnect. It, quite often, nowadays, it's, it's economic or it's uh, political. Most of the multiculturalism we talk about in Europe is post-migration or post-immigration. That's very different from other kinds. So the Reconnect program set a clear agenda that put cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue as mechanisms to mobilize the reconnection of these forces in whatever society they find. My passion at the moment is to make sure we elevate cultural diversity to the level that poverty and climate change are. I think we understand the global challenges of poverty and its contribution to peace. And we understand the global challenges of protecting our very uh, fragile world. But I think cultural diversity should be up there. I think it is the third uh, leg to my stool. Without getting hold and managing cultural diversity, 
we cannot create the human security that we need.